Good, good afternoon, everyone. So that is the uh, last session of this uh, Money Market Conference. So thanks for uh, your attention on a Friday afternoon after, I understand, two uh, intense uh, days. But uh, we have something uh, new to offer in this session, new forms of money, and there's a lot of talk on uh, CBDC, stable coins, and so on. And uh, it's uh, yeah, a good idea to check how the new forms of money matter for money markets and monetary policy implementation and financial stability in that context. And I have uh, two, I think, great papers here and uh, two, um, two discussions. So we can start maybe straight with the first uh, paper. And uh, Jorge is research economist at the Banco de España. And he has uh, brought together the topics of the operational framework and, um, and CBDC and integrated that into a macro model. And that is quite an impressive uh, paper that he will present. And then Cyril, who is a research uh, professor in Bern and a colleague from the ECB long, long time ago, but that's uh, how I remember you also. Uh, he will discuss that afterwards. And I guess like in all the other sessions, you have 25 minutes, then 15 minutes for the discussion and five minutes for all the rest. Yeah, so please, uh, Roger. Thank you very much. Um, thanks for the introduction. And let me thank the organizers for including our paper in the program. We are very honored uh, uh, to be part of, of, of this impress impressive uh, lineup. Uh, so this is joint work with my colleagues, uh, Galo Nuno and Carlos Tomas at Banco de España. Galo is currently at the, at the BIS. And uh, the usual disclaimer applies. These are only our views. Uh, so, as you, as you can see from the title, we are be talking about uh, central bank digital currencies. And for the purpose of today's talk, uh, we are going to abstract many of the uh, features of, of, of or potential features of CBDCs. Uh, we are going to focus on the, what we think uh, for the purpose of, of today's talk is the most important uh, part, which is that this is a digital liability of the central bank that is widely available to the general public. And uh, we are going to start from other aspects, uh, including the technological ones, uh, but I'm going to be a bit more, more specific in a second about uh, how we model CBDC. Now, the motivation for this paper is the increasing attention that uh, CBDCs have received, uh, both from authorities and academics that are reflected in the uh, vast amount of work that has been published uh, uh, recently in a short amount of time, covering different uh, implications of CBDCs regarding topics such as financial stability, currency competition, financial inclusion, payment, payments and innovation, and, and, and some other more. We are going to try to cover what we see as a, as a gap uh, in the literature, which is the implications of central bank digital currencies on the operational framework of, of monetary policy. So hopefully uh, uh, interesting for, for the audience today, given it's uh, related to the topic of, of the conference. But we are also going to be uh, analyzing the broader macro macroeconomic effects of introducing a CBDC and how these effects are interrelated with the operational framework of monetary policy, in particular how interaction of, of monetary policy, uh, the, the, the effects of the CBDC are going to depend on the particular operational uh, framework of monetary policy that the central bank is operating. And also CBDC is going to affect the operational framework itself. So, in the paper, uh, what we do is that we introduce CBDC in a realistic new Keynesian model of monetary policy transmission. This is, this, uh, this is a model uh, with households that have preferences for different liquid assets, including cash, commercial bank deposits, and CBDC. Uh, there's going to be heterogeneous banks that trade with each other uh, in a frictional interbank market, and the central bank is going to be implementing monetary policy by affecting the conditions in that market. So then to, to the extent that the introduction of CBDC can affect also the conditions in this market, there's going to be an effect of interaction of, 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 of CBDC that is going to depend on the particular operational framework that the central, with which the central bank implements monetary policy. We are going to calibrate the model to replicate uh, some of the facts and, and uh, monetary and financial aggregates in the euro area. And we are going to try to answer some questions with this, with this model. Uh, going from uh, what is the effect of the deposit crunch that is induced by the uh, introduction of CBDC, whether this leads to a decrease also in, in lending from banks, whether this depends on the operational framework of, of monetary policy, 
and how this affects the operational framework, whether the central bank needs to adjust or, or how can it do so. The main findings that we have is that the adoption of CBDC leads to a reduction of the deposit funding of banks. And this is translated into uh, an adjustment of banks that can take two forms. Uh, for a moderate uh, adoption of CBDC, we find that banks reduce their excess reserves, as, as, as one could expect. But of course, since the level of excess reserves uh, at the time of introduction of, of CBDC uh, is given by the, by the portfolio of the central bank, then at some point when the level of excess reserves uh, run, runs down, uh, for a larger level of CBDC adoption, uh, there's an in, we observe an increase in the recourse uh, uh, of commercial banks to central bank credit. And therefore, what we find is that even large reductions in deposit funding have rather small effects on credit. So banks are able to substitute first by reducing uh, excess reserves and then relying on the credit extended by the central bank. Now, the fall in excess reserves uh, is not without consequences. This has consequences for monetary policy implementation and forces the central bank to adjust and transition from a, from a floor system to a corridor system and eventually uh, possibly a ceiling system. Finally, we are going to show that uh, some characteristics of CBDC, in particular here, uh, its remuneration, are going to have some effects at the macro level. If CBDC is non-remunerated, this has uh, small but still non-negligible non non effects, uh, contractionary effects on, 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 on the macroeconomy by reducing the household's return on their, on their savings. So now I'm going to briefly uh, go through the model, uh, try to give you a flavor of the ingredients that we have, and then I'm going to go through the uh, calibration and quantitative exercises. So this is the overview uh, of and the different agents in the economy and their balance sheets and how they are uh, interrelated. Uh, as I said, households can invest in different types of liquid assets that are not going to be uh, perfect substitutes. Uh, they are going to lend deposits to commercial banks which are going to combine those with equity and possibly uh, lending uh, from the central bank in order to invest in claims issued by, issued by firms. Uh, also, they can invest in government bonds and central bank reserves. On the liability side of the central bank, it has the excess reserves held by banks, physical cash has held by households, and when CBDC is introduced, which in the, ba in the baseline... Uh, we, we don't have CBDC, but then we do the uh, comparative statics of introducing a CBDC. Uh, then this CBDC is issued uh, and held directly uh, by the households. And the central bank can invest in government bonds and it can also lend, lend to banks, either in the standard uh, lending facility or uh, through uh, targeted lending operations. Uh, I'm going to show you some, some of the equations of the model, but I will try to be brief. Uh, we assume the households have as, uh, this instantaneous utility function in which uh, they, have, uh, uh, they have some preferences for uh, liquid assets, and we assume that these liquid assets are not perfect substitutes uh, of each other. And here we are following uh, some other papers in the literature, but you can think of this as a reduced form representation of preference uh, heterogeneity across the cross-section of households or, or other dimensions uh, that you can think of, but basically Capital D is uh, commercial bank deposits, uh, capital M is physical cash, and uh, D, uh, superscript DC, is uh, the digital currency issued by the, by the central bank. So what we are going to do in the uh, quantitative exercise is play around with the share, eta uh, DC, uh, to see how different levels of the demand for CBDC are going to affect uh, operational framework of monetary policy and, and banking sector and, and the macro, uh, uh, and the macro economy. Now, for the banking sector, we are going to assume there's a continuum of banks that operate in different segmented markets here, uh, islands denoted by J. And these banks are going to start every period with some equity that is accumulated from previous periods. And they are going to decide on, on the, the, the amount of deposits they want to issue. After they have decided on their issuance of deposits, they learn how productive are the firms to which they can lend. So then some banks are going to have very profitable investment opportunities, while some others uh, might not. But they have to make a portfolio choice, which is either financing the firms within their island, or if these firms are not uh, very productive, they can also purchase government bonds, or they can borrow or lend 
uh, at the interbank market at some at some effective rates uh, at some effective rates that are endogenously determined. Now the bank is making this decision subject to a leverage constraint that limits the amount of lending it can it can give to to firms uh, to a fraction of its if it's of its own equity. You can think of uh, capital requirements, and then. I'm going to show you later on that there are some frictions that make some banks uh, not able to find a partner in the interbank market. And those banks are going to be able to access the standing facilities of the central bank. So a bank wants to borrow, but doesn't find a partner in the interbank market. It can borrow from the central bank. The same for a bank that has some excess funds and want to deposit them. I'm going to introduce some notation, but this, uh, this fee uh, B and, and, and fee L are just the aggregate amounts of, of borrowing and lending orders uh, in the banking sector. Now, the interbank market uh, is a decentralized uh, OTC market characterized by some search frictions that make that uh, markets do not automatically clear. And there's the possibility that some banks do not find a partner with which to trade. Now, there's going to be some matching probabilities that are going to reflect the degree of interbank market tightness denoted by, uh, by uh, theta here, which is the fraction of the um, amount of lending orders sorry, amount of borrowing orders divided by the amount of lending orders. And this reflects that the less participants that are on one side of the market, the easier is for those participants in that side of the market to find, to find a partner. As I said, banks that do not find a partner can borrow or lend from the central bank at some uh, deposit facility rates and lending facility rates. And those that do find a partner in the interbank market, uh, they trade as, at some given equilibrium interbank rate which reflects the fact that the uh, more or less tightness in the market, the interbank rate is going to be closer uh, to the deposit facility rate or closer to the lending facility rate. So uh, from here, you can see that the position of the interbank market is going to be within the policy rates uh, corridor, and its position is going to depend on the supply of excess liquidity by the, by the central bank. Now, the central bank is going to set the two policy rates such that the width of the corridor is assumed to be constant and uh, uh, equal to a fixed uh, parameter chi. And such that the interbank market rate, which in this model is the operational target, is going to follow a Taylor rule with, with inertia. This is the balance sheet of the central bank, which is, uh, as I showed you in the diagram at the beginning, uh, composed of uh, bond holdings and the lending facility uh, loans on the asset side and deposit the excess reserves and cash and CBDC uh, when eventually CBDC is introduced on the liability side. Now let me just very quickly summarize how the liquidity conditions affect the operational uh, framework of monetary policy. This is a topic that has already uh, been present in the conference and, and we saw uh, in the session on operational frameworks uh, how, how this works. But just to summarize this in, in terms of our model, Floor system is characterized by an abundant, uh, by abundant liquidity conditions so that interbank uh, market tightness goes to zero. This means that there's a large banks of uh, banks willing to lend, small mass of banks uh, willing to, to borrow. What happens is that all borrowing banks are matched with lending uh, banks, and most of the banks that are willing to, to lend have to deposit at the central bank. And therefore, the interbank rate is set by the floor of the corridor. In a corridor system, in our model, theta, the interbank market tightness, is between 0 and 1. Most borrowing banks are matched with lending ones, and most lending banks are matched with borrowing ones. There's, there's a typo there. And therefore, the interbank uh, rate is somewhere in the middle of the corridor between the, the two uh, facility rates. And uh, as you can already anticipate, the ceiling system is the opposite image of, of the floor system in which there's a scarce liquidity conditions, uh, interbank market goes to, to one, then most borrowing banks obtain uh, central bank loans. All of the lending banks are matched with borrowing banks and the interbank rate is set by the ceiling of the corridor. So now that we have gone through the model, I'm going to uh, very briefly explain the calibration. Uh, we try to replicate we, we try to make the model replicate the euro system and euro area banking sector balance sheets in the medium run. So since we don't know how these are going to look in the medium run, we, what we do is that we go to the uh, forecasts by the sur uh, survey of monetary analysts uh, published uh, by the ECB, 
and we find what is the level of the deposit facility rate and what is the size of the uh, bond programs in the balance sheet of the euro system uh, by the end of the decade. And that's our, those are our um, calibration targets. Then for the elasticity of substitution between the different types of, of liquid assets, we take this, this value from, from the literature, from what other papers have estimated. Finally, the interbank match, matching function is going to be calibrated so that we can fit the observed relationship in the data between excess reserves and interest rates. Uh, so basically, uh, each dot here is an observation uh, from the euro area. On the vertical axis is the interbank market rate uh, minus the deposit facility rate. And we try to calibrate the, um, the matching function so that we, uh, we are able to replicate uh, the relationship between the excess reserves as a percentage of, of, of GDP and this spread of the interbank rate with the, with the deposit facility rate. Uh, this is just the value of the, uh, the values resulting from our calibration of the balance sheets of commercial banks and the central bank. Just let me point to the numbers that I think are most, most relevant. Uh, central bank uh, reserves are in this calibration 5.5% uh, of GDP. And uh, also cash is 10% uh, of, of, of GDP. And you're going to see how those numbers change once CBDC is introduced, which in our baseline uh, scenario is, is zero. And then we play around with the demand for, for CBDC and see how these values, see how these values change. So this is the main, uh, the main results of, of the paper. This is, the res the, this is what happens when the central bank introduces a CBDC, a CBDC that is not remunerated. And these are comparisons in the long run. So each of the points in these lines is a different steady state that is characterized by a different intake of CBDC in equilibrium. So the horizontal axis is uh, CBDC in circulation as a percentage of, of GDP. And the vertical axis is each of these endogenous variable as a response to uh, the level of CBDC in equilibrium. So what you can see in panel A is that the demand for CBDC, uh, as the demand for CBDC increases, there's a reduction in cash, which is the uh, blue line, and a reduction in deposits, which is, which is the red line, uh, as a result, because households substitute some of their liquid assets to invest in this CBDC. As this happens, as the demand for CBDC increases, there's a decrease in the excess reserve, so a decrease in the, in the use of the deposit facility uh, uh, by these banks. And uh, at some point, when the, when the, when the equilibrium amount of excess reserves is uh, low enough, then there are some banks that want to borrow in the interbank market. They are not able to do so because of the reduction in, in deposits, reductions in, in liquidity uh, of banks they start resorting to the lending facility of the central bank. Now, the central bank, as I showed you before, is following a Taylor rule, and it wants to keep its, its stance uh, constant when CBDC is introduced. In order to do so, it has to uh, shift its uh, policy rates uh, corridor, as you can see in panel C. Uh, by doing so, the interbank market rate, at some point, uh, because of the reduction in excess reserves, is going to lift from the floor uh, of the corridor, and the central bank is going to start operating in a corridor system, which is characterized by the interbank rate, which is the yellow one, uh, sitting uh, between the red one, which is uh, the deposit facility rate, and the blue one, which is the lending facility rate. At some point, when excess reserves get to zero, and, the, and uh, a large enough fraction of banks rely on the lending operations of the central bank, then the uh, interbank rate becomes anchored to the uh, ceiling of the corridor, and the central bank starts operating a ceiling system in which the interbank rate equals the lending facility rate. These are the, the, the first, so the first row summarizes the effects of the interaction of CBDC for the operational framework of monetary policy. The second row is going to talk about the macroeconomic effects. So as I said in the introduction, since the uh, CBDC is not remunerated, then this has an effect in panel E on the wealth that households uh, accumulate because they substitute some uh, assets that, uh, that are remunerated, such as uh, commercial bank deposits, with some asset that is not remunerated, CBDC, and this has this impact on, on their wealth that then is, trans is translated into negative effects on uh, bank credit output 
and, uh, and uh, the level of bank equity in the, in, the, in the red line. Now I'm going to explain in a second why, but you might have noticed that the red line in the last uh, panel uh, shows uh, uh, this U shape of the response of bank equity to the interaction of CBDC that coincides with the region in which the central bank operates a corridor system. So this is the way in which uh, the interaction of CBDC, depending on the operational framework that the central with which the central bank implements monetary policy, is going to have real effects and, and, and more importantly, effects on the, on the uh, banking sector. So let me talk for a second about the equivalence result, and then I'm going to tell you why uh, there's this U shape uh, there. So we can, since I said that the, the macro effects uh, pretty much come from the fact that CBDC is not remunerated, then you can think uh, of a way of introducing a CBDC with a remuneration such that the uh, returns on household savings do not change. And that is what we call the wealth neutral remuneration rate of CBDC in the spirit of, of the paper by uh, Bruno Maya and Nippelt, in which they show that you can design a CBDC such that it doesn't have uh, aggregate consequences uh, at the macro level. We show that for, our, for CBDC in our model to be neutral, it has to be remunerated, remunerated at a particular rate, which is a combination of the remuneration of commercial bank deposits in the baseline and cash, which is remunerated at, at, at zero in nominal terms. With this wealth neutral remuneration rate, you are able to keep wealth of households constant, provided, and this is important, that the central bank is operating a floor system or a ceiling system. And this is related to this U shape that I was mentioning before in panel F. This is because when the central bank operates a corridor system, some of the proactive banks that want to borrow from the, from, at the interbank market, they fail to find a match in this market and they are forced to borrow from the central bank instead. Now, since the central bank is operating a corridor system, and this is what we show here, this is the interaction of CVC when CVC is remunerated at the wealth neutral rate. You see that at the region where the central bank is operating a corridor system, there's still this effect on bank equity, small effect on credit and, and output. And as I said, this is because when uh, a bank wants to borrow but cannot do so at the interbank rate, then it has to borrow at the, at the level that is given by the blue line, which is higher. So this penalizes the profitability of banks and uh, distorts lending decisions of banks. So for uh, the interaction of CBDC to be neutral, and uh, let me uh, reiterate, one needs this uh, CBDC to be remunerated at a particular rate, and also the central bank needs to be operating a floor system or a ceiling system, but not, not a corridor one, because of this effect that, that we mentioned. The uh, magnitudes are not very large, but, but still they are, they are non-negligible. Non, non non uh, now, what we do next is assess what are the policies that the central bank can implement in order to preserve the floor system. So as you can expect, if the central bank injects a large enough amount of reserves in compensation for the reduction of reserves uh, that, that disappear because of the interaction of CBDC, it can still operate a floor system. So we analyze two different policies, either asset purchases. Uh, so we characterize what is the increase in the central bank bond holdings that is necessary to keep the level of excess reserves at the level before the interaction of CBDC. And we characterize uh, what is the targeted loans program that the central bank needs to implement? We assume that these loans are remunerated at the uh, deposit facility rate, and we characterize what is the allowance, which is proportional to the loan portfolio of banks. This is why these are targeted loans. Uh, that is necessary to keep the level of excess reserve at, at their pre-CBDC uh, level. And uh, the results point to a significant uh, increase uh, of both uh, government bond holdings and, and targeted loans uh, as a percentage of GDP and also in terms of uh, its impact on the balance sheet of banks. Uh, what we take uh, from, from this is that uh, an obvious uh, limitation of, uh, for instance, asset purchases is that if the demand for CBC were to be large enough, then the central bank might run out of uh, government bonds uh, to, to purchase uh, if it wants to respect its, its capital key, uh, for instance. But, but here uh, we, we, we provide some, some, some numbers for, for the size of these programs. And uh, 
The final exercise that I'm going to describe today in the last uh, two minutes that I have is that we also look at the transitional dynamics of going from a steady state without CVDC into a steady state with a positive demand for CVDC. Here we have two different scenarios, one with a low demand for CVDC, uh, which is 4% of GDP in the long run, and that is the blue line, and a high demand for CVDC, which is around 7% of GDP in the long run. Uh, so in both cases, as you can see in the panel in the middle, panel E, the central bank is forced to abandon the floor system, and you see there's a gap, uh, there, there's a spread there between the interbank market rate, which is the dotted line, and the deposit facility rate, uh, which is the solid line. So at the beginning in period one, both lines are at the same uh, point because the central bank is operating a floor system. Now, the reduction in excess reserves in panel D forces the bank, uh, forces the, the, the policy rates to, to, to separate at some point, and the central bank starts operating a, a courier system. Now, since, as we showed before, interaction of a non remunerated CBDC has contractionary effects, this has an effect in inflation. Uh, so there's a deflationary effect. And uh, perhaps a little bit counterintuitively, at the beginning, uh, in order to take advantage of this decrease in, infl in inflation, banks doing, uh, sorry, households do increase their uh, demand for cash uh, in, the, in the short run, even though in the long run uh, there's this decrease in, in, in the level of banknotes in, in circulation. Now let me conclude, since, since I'm running out of time. Uh, what we've done with this paper is uh, seeing the effects of introducing a CBDC in a realistic model of monetary policy transition, we show that uh, the decrease in deposits does not necessarily lead to a decrease in lending from banks, and this reflects the impact of the operational framework of monetary policy and the endogenous adjustment of central bank rates that allows to uh, mitigate the effects of the interaction of, of, of CBDC. We characterize what are the policies necessary to compensate the reduction in excess reserves if the central bank for some reason wanted to, to preserve the floor system. And we highlight how some of these results depend on specific features of CVC. In particular, I've talked about uh, the remuneration. So thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, and Cyril. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Ulrich. Uh, always uh, great to be back. Um, so it was a great paper. Uh, uh, and we know that CBDC is very high on the agenda of many central banks, if not all. And, but there's very few papers that actually study how CBDC is going to impact the implementation of monetary policy. Uh, and most papers study the macro effect of CBDC. So here, it's a nice exception uh, where we both have the macro effects, as well as uh, the impact on monetary policy implementation. What are the main results? What are the main takeaway? Uh, the first one is that as long as uh, the central bank operates a floor system, uh, there's going to be a minor impact of introducing CBDC on the economy. Um, then the impact is the following. So if you have a take up of CBDC, which is approximately 20% of GDP, so relatively large, uh, the reduction in capital is going to be less than 1%. Okay, so that's what I mean by small impact. Um, in that sense, also, you have that CBDC has a small contractionary effect, and it's not going to be inflationary. Okay? To the reverse, you're going to have deflation when you introduce CBDC. Now, if you worry about these effects, even though they are tiny, you, might un you are going to be able to undo them by remunerating CBDC. Okay? So that's sort of a, a surprising result here. And so, you know, in one sentence, uh, the message of the paper is going to be, don't fear CBDC, especially if it's remunerated. I would have expected some of you to boo, right, at this stage. <laughs> anyway, so uh, quickly as a setup, uh, there's going to be uh, two periods. So it's infinite horizon, but let, let's consider it's two periods. There's going to be uh, households a pair of bank and firms, okay, so it's just one guy if you want, one banker, and then you're going to have the central banks that issue CBDC. Okay, households, they're going to have a portfolio of money, CBDC, and capital, and they might want to acquire deposits from banks. Okay, so banks are going to be on different islands. Okay, these islands are not like different countries, um, although you might want to think about that for the euro area. Um, and 
So the, the banks are going to issue deposits to the households. These deposits are going to pay an interest RD. Okay, so these deposits are important because they are the way that banks acquire reserves okay, in this model. Now, the, uh, once this market for deposits is closed, the banks learn about productivity shocks. Okay? So you're going to have three types of banks. You're going to have red out banks. So these guys, they really want reserves because they are very productive. You have uh, blue banks. These guys, they're not productive. They don't want reserves. And you have green banks. These guys, they are just at the right level. Okay? Um, so these reserves are going to be reallocated in an interbank market, in this black box. Once they are reallocated, uh, the banks that are really productive, they are going to acquire capital from households. They might want to borrow from the central bank facility if they like a little bit of reserves. Um, and, yeah, and the guys who have too much reserves, they will deposit at the central bank facility. Okay. At this stage, you know, the productive banks, they produce, and with their production, they are going to reimburse all their, uh, all their debt. Um, the, okay, so now let's open the, the black box of the interbank market. How does it work? It's a directed search environment where you have many of these wannabe borrowers. You have many of these wannabe lenders, the blue banks, and you have some wannabe alone. Okay, these guys, they don't want to trade. Uh, they are perfectly happy with the level of reserves that they have. Uh, so the wannabe borrowers are going to be matched with wannabe lenders, pairwise, and then they are going to exchange uh, reserves. Uh, at an interest rate R of IB. Okay, that's the interbank market rate. Those guys who are not matched, they go to the lending facility to borrow if they need to borrow. And those guys who are not matched and have excess reserves, they are going to go to the deposit facility to deposit their excess reserves. Um, so, you know, it seems like it's important to understand this setup to understand what's, what's coming up. So that's why I go through that. So here is the model in a nutshell. So again, you have that banks, they first issue deposits, that's how they acquire reserves, and then they learn their shocks, their productivity shocks. Okay? So at this stage, they might want to borrow, to lend, and so on on the interbank market. They face some frictions, that's quite important. Then they produce, they acquire capital from households, uh, and so on. Okay. So this is a modern pool model. Okay? The pool model is relatively old, uh, 1968. I'm speaking for myself here. Um, and um, the, in the pool model, you have that the interbank market rate is a weighted average of the lending rate and the deposit rate, as we have seen uh, many times uh, in these two days, where the weights are a function of the market tightness. Okay, so the market tightness is how, many, how much borrowers there is in this market. If there is a lot of borrowers in this market, the interbank market rate, the weight is going to be put on the lending rate, okay? And it's going to, so if market tightness is very high, the, the interbank market rate is going to be pushed towards the ceiling, okay? the lending rate. If the market tightness is very low, there's a lot of lenders, and the interbank market rate is pushed towards the deposit facility rate, okay? Now, what's important here is, and that's why it's, it's a modern version of the pool model, is because the deposit rate, the rate at which households deposit their money is also going to be a type of pool rate, okay? in the sense that it's going to be a weighted average of uh, the interbank market rate, the deposit facility rates, and the rate of return on capital. Okay? So let's, let's try to understand that. So remember this, this timeline, right? So first you acquire deposit. Okay? So you, have one, you acquire deposit by issuing your deposit at an interest rate RD. Okay, so you have one unit of reserve. What can you do? So that's, you know, the cost of acquiring this reserve is RD on the left-hand side. What is the benefit? Well, if you turn out to be a red bank, you really need reserve, okay? Now, so having this additional unit of reserve that you acquired through issuing deposits is going to be useful to you because if uh, you're matched, you're going to economize on the interbank market rate on this marginal unit of reserves. If you're not matched, you're going to economize on the lending facility rate with this additional unit of reserve. So that's, for you as a red bank, that's the value of having this additional unit of reserves. What is the value if you're a blue bank? If you're a blue bank, you don't want to 
you don't want to invest, you just want to lend your reserves. So this additional unit of reserves, if you're matched, is going to give you the interbank market rate. If you're not matched, you will deposit it at the deposit facility rate, and that's it. If you're a green bank, you're happy with this additional unit of reserve, you just invest it. Okay? So that's why you get this prob So if you end up being a green bank with this probability P of omega, then you get the expected return on, cap on investing it, so the return on capital. Okay, so why is it important? Because then we get, you know, the usual demand curve on the interbank market. Okay, we have seen, we have seen this curve many times again. So on the, y, on the x axis, you have the demand for reserves or the supply of reserves if you want. And then the interbank, uh, given this amount of reserves, the interbank market rate is going to be given by the blue line. Okay, um, so this is the pool rate. Now, I think that if you plot the same curve for the, the uh, deposit rate, you're going to get a curve that's sort of tilting the blue curve downward. Okay? So why is that important? So I'm, you know, I put a question mark because I'm not quite sure this is going to happen, and I would like Jorge to plot it just to make sure that you know, this is correct. But if this is correct, this is a way to sort of have a test of the model. Okay? Why? Because if you decrease the excess reserve here, what do you see? You see that uh, the deposit rate is increasing faster than the interbank market rate. Okay, so is that true in the data? I don't know. Okay, so but it would be nice to know. Okay, um, now how is D determined? So this excess reserve. Okay, well it depends on how much households want deposits. But this is given to you by the assumption that households have money in the UT function, okay, given by this MOG here, um, and. It's useful to know that when agents have money in the utility function, and here they have not money, but they have deposits, they have money, and they have CBDC in the utility function, as soon as you have an additional element in the, your utility function, the households are going to demand it. Okay, that's a given. How strong will they demand it depend on this eta. Okay, so this is the parameter that Jorge was, was changing. Okay, so as soon as eta is positive, so as soon as the ECB in some sense will issue the digital euro, there's going to be a demand for it. That's sort of given by this function, okay? Okay, so um, if you introduce the digital euro, CBDC, you're going to have that automatically the deposits will fall. Okay, so this means that the banks will have less reserves, and so there's going to be a point where maybe there's going to be a lift off. Okay, you're going to go away from the floor if you are at the floor, and you're going to have uh, a corridor system. Okay? So what is the estimated um, take-up of CBDC such that you have a lift-off? Okay? So in their paper, they calibrated to be around 3% of GDP, which is approximately 1,200 euro per person. Okay? But we know that the digital euro is going to have a limit of more or less, but that's what has been published so far, uh, of 3,000 euro uh, for any, every account. Okay, so this is way uh, below this, right? So if you have that all the agents take up CBDC, then you're going to have a lift off uh, here for sure, according to this model. Okay, now why is that? Okay, so why do we have a lift off and why do we have? Uh, what are the macro implications of this lift off? So recall that agents have money in the utility function. Okay, so what does that mean? This means that as soon as you introduce CBDC, which here is not remunerated, remember, the agents are going to switch from remunerated deposits, bank deposits, to holding unremunerated CBDC. Okay, what does that mean? This means that because they have money in the, in the utility function, they choose to have less wealth. Okay, that's, that's what this implies, this assumption of money in the utility function. Uh, but if they have less wealth, you know, at the macro level, there's going to be less wealth in this economy. And so when you aggregate things, you end up that the level or the value of capital is going to go down. Okay? Uh, and also here, the bank equity is going to go down because of the lift off. Okay? It's going to be more expensive for banks to issue uh, deposits, and therefore, uh, their, the bank equity goes down. So that's sort of the, the intuition for what's going on. What is the macro effect in the number? Well, so Jorge didn't sort of uh, emphasize that, but if you look at the numbers on the y-axis, 
this is tiny. Okay, so essentially here, if I look at the, the right panel, the bank credit equity and output, on top here you have 100, below it's 99.4. Okay, so 0.6%, that's the bend. Okay, so essentially, uh, you know, the effects are gonna be tiny, which, you know, I like. It's actually reconforting. Um, now, let's see what happens if the digital euro goes through and uh, people take up the maximum, so 3,000, okay? So we all have digital euro and we all go with 3,000. Uh, so we all take up the maximum that we can, okay, 3,000. So this means that, and this, this you can read on the x-axis, there's gonna be, the take up is gonna be approximately 8% of GDP, okay? Given that the GDP per person is 40,000, okay, in the euro area. So you end up at 8% approximately. So if you read what 8% take up means, it means that GDP is gonna drop by 0, 0,15%. Okay, so that steady state, you know, is that big, small? To me, it looks pretty small, okay? Um, of course, we would have to compare that to the benefit of having the digital euro, but anyway. So um, now, if you worry that this is big, okay, then there's a solution that Yoge talked about. What you want to do is to keep the wealth of individuals as it was before, okay? Because again, here, remember that because of money in the utility function, as soon as you introduce CBDC, people switch from remunerated bank deposits to unremunerated CBDC, their wealth go down, and therefore all the value in the economy goes down, okay? So if you remunerate CBDC, it undoes the negative effect uh, and maintains uh, the, uh, the wealth of, of households. Okay, so um, there's my comments uh, very briefly. Um, so the first comment is about the matching frictions. The matching frictions is super important in the model in order to, um, to pin down the level where you have liftoff, okay? So if there is a lot of matching frictions in this economy, the liftoff is gonna happen much sooner uh, in terms of take-up. So if you have small take-up and a lot of matching frictions in the market, then you're gonna have a lift-off uh, very, very fast. Um, and so I think that uh, it would be nice to have a robustness check regarding this matching friction parameter uh, in the model because I, this is key for the lift-off. Um, okay, the, the comment, second comment, uh, this is still a macro-ish contribution on CBDC. Um, Money market matters, okay, in this environment, but we would like to have more, okay? Uh, so the interbank market could be also made simpler, okay? Uh, still the macro results would obtain. Now we know that, you know, the EU interbank market is uh, fragmented, okay? And this is where the frictions in the, in the interbank market is gonna be important. Uh, and so it would be nice to actually model uh, the fragmentation of the EU uh, market. Um, it would be nice also, given the discussion on the lean, you know, corridor versus floor system that we had, uh, whether, you know, the results would change if the, if the ECB would introduce CBDC after having returned to a corridor system. At the moment, it's all the floor. Um, second comment, uh, and then I, I'm going to finish on that. So introducing CBDC is contractionary, okay? Um, now, there's a way to undo the contraction, is to remunerate CBDC. We know there is a rate because they show it in the paper, but it would be nice to know what this rate should, could be, right? I mean, so we need an estimation for this rate. And actually, if paying the rate sort of undoes the negative effect, do you have a rate that is expansionary, okay? Uh, and I have a paper with uh, Nora uh, Lamensdorf and Tobias Linzert uh, where we find that there is. Um, conclusion, the good news uh, to me, reading this paper, that CBDC does not hamper the functioning of money market. If anything, it will increase uh, the volume. So, you know, for those who want to revive the interbank market, that's good. The 3,000 euro limit might just be maintaining the floor, okay, but more robustness is needed. Uh, CBDC has tiny macro effect and it is not inflationary. Now, remunerating CBDC is a good idea, and so that's, that's the good news. The bad news is that the digital euro at least at first, will not be remunerated. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank Sorry you. for... No problem. Two minutes. Um, 
No, thanks. Uh, so now the floor is open, and, and can I can I start um, also with uh, one or two comments? So, I mean, the paper I think is impressively done and puts together literatures, uh, you know, which uh, match new Keynesian models with money markets, with operation framework, and then with CBDC. I personally, you know, have doubts on the literature you start from. And both the one, you know, which matches uh, CBDC and macro things and um, operational framework and macro topics. Because, you know, the, the interrelationship between the macroeconomy, between consumption decisions and, um, and um, production just has little to do with the money market. Now, in the money market, the shocks which bring banks to meet in the money market are just, you know, pure liquidity uh, shocks. You know, you have outflows in one bank has outflows, the other has inflows on a day, but they have no content, you know, they have no economic, real economic content. And uh, those issues of money markets, you know, the, they are, I would say, being taken care of in the money market, in the operational framework, in the central bank, adjusting liquidity on a day by day basis. So. I, I have fundamental doubts on this literature, on the relevance of this literature, which makes a huge effort to bring together sophisticated macro models and the money market in a way that cannot work out, in my view, to bring relevant uh, results. But that's not your fault, it's the big literature. <laughs> and, uh, and I think the same mistake is being done on, uh, on the literature now matching CBDC um, and macro. Um, because the literature, you know, you would first of all have to meaningfully model what is the difference between CBDC and banknotes. You know, from all this balance sheet perspective, it's, all, it's exactly the same. No, there's no difference. So you would have to, um, I mean, you could write the same paper, uh, if I'm not wrong, on, on um, taking as a starting point the evolution of the volume of banknotes. Now, if banknotes go up, and you don't adjust liquidity, then of course you have uh, effects. The assumption that a central bank would not adjust liquidity to changes in banknotes is of course the wrong assumption. Of course the central bank adjusts liquidity on a daily basis. So all this literature which brings together, you know, which, which tries to model CBDs from a macro perspective would have to really zoom into what the difference is, why, why it's a difference to banknotes and um, I fear that we are very far from knowing this because CBDC is not um, introduced in a static environment, but it is introduced because everybody moves to electronic retail payments. No? Therefore, we are not in a static world. And uh, it's very, you know, you cannot say, now I introduce CBDC, something happens. You know, preferences of households towards holding forms of money and using them are not stable. That's why we have CBDC being introduced. No? So, that's just, you know, it's not your fault, so don't take it personally. But I fundamentally doubt on the relevance and practice of um, those two lines of literature. Okay, those are very strong comments and, uh, um, yeah, forgive me. They, they of course, also uh, relate to, to the work um, of others and, yeah, but please. Um, I, um, I was um, wondering, I think you did not have um, bank regulation and collateral requirements in your uh, model, so I believe that those would also impact um, the, the um, volume that, that banks could get on their interbank market and also at the central bank. So I was wondering whether you could elaborate on that. We can collect some questions. You can answer in one go, please. Yeah, uh, my question is related to the, um, the previous question, because um, uh, we need to consider the role of banks that in the model is not uh, absolutely considered, you know, because uh, if a bank wants to maintain loan to deposit ratio unchanged, they need to reduce loans. Or in, when you have the, basically the, the transfer from deposits to CNBC. Or uh, back, uh, another thing, all banks need to increase reserves from the central banks, but they need uh, high quality collateral. 
so probably they tend to buy bonds instead of lending. Also, collateral is important for the interbank market lending, you know, which is one of your, your assumptions. So probably the impact, the macroeconomic impact on credit will be much stronger than what is suggested to the model, um, leading to a credit crunch. So I would like to know if uh, something you have considered or would like to consider you now, including banks' um, uh, behavior in the model. Thank you. Okay. One more comment there. Hi, David Porcellacchia from the ECB. So in your model, essentially, CBDC seems to me like it's a cheap way for the government to borrow. And as Cyril pointed out, that is kind of a transfer of wealth from the household sector to the government sector. Now, I think if you have a new Keynesian model and you sort of pin down inflation with the fiscal theory, it would tell you that that is deflationary. So I'm wondering if sort of this is one way of understanding a result. Okay, thank you. Let's, uh, let's stop the questions here for timing reasons. Okay. There's no online questions to Jorge. Th thank you very much for, for all the comments. Uh, they are all well taken. Uh, and thanks, thanks for, the, for, the, for the great discussion. There's a lot of uh, food for thought and, and things that we need to think a bit uh, more carefully. Uh, so regarding your comments on the interbank market, it indeed can be made simpler and the result, macro results, would, most of them would still go through. Not those related to whether the central bank changes to a floor system, from a floor system to a courier system. Uh, but what we wouldn't, th that is precisely why we wanted to have this perhaps a bit overly complicated interbank market in the model, which is to see whether, what quantitatively what would be the, po the point of, of, of the lift off uh, from, from uh, I mean, fr from the point of view of our model. But indeed, um, there's more work that we need to do in order to assess the sensitivity of, of the results, if, if that is uh, the, uh, one of the ob objectives of the paper, to be able to quantify this. Uh, indeed, uh, I agree that the, the sensitivity on the matching function uh, th there is something that we need to do. And answering your question whether there's a remuneration for which CBDC can be uh, expansionary, yes, indeed. Uh, that is one of the results uh, that we could show. Whether this is welfare improving or not, that, that's a different question. And, I mean, we don't talk about welfare at all in, in, in our discussion. Uh, there are many frictions in our model related to the interbank market, uh, capital requirements, so on, that could be undone or made worse with the remuneration of CBC that we don't want to enter this, this welfare uh, debate. But, but yeah, I mean, short answer, yes, can be expansionary if the remuneration is, is higher. Um, then, going back to the comment on whether uh, CBDC in our model can be distinguished from, from cash, uh, the only difference is the possibility of remunerating uh, CBDC. Indeed, the unremunerated part uh, is, is, is uh, the unremunerated exercise. Uh, you can just call everything uh, banknotes and, and everything would be the same. So, so you're right. Uh, but, but we do want to emphasize the part on, on the analysis and the remuneration. So, so that, that, I would say, would be the main difference in terms of modeling. Uh, now, there was a question whether we have uh, regulation for banks. Uh, we do, I mean, we do have uh, capital regulation, and we don't play around with changing that, that parameter. We just take it from, say, from the data. Uh, liquidity regu regulation or, or reserve requirements we could, uh, we could have. We don't at the moment. And this would have an effect on the point of the liftoff. So, so indeed, uh, that might be that might might be a bit a bit more relevant. So that that's a, that's a good comment. Uh, but yeah, I think it would only have quantitative effects. Uh, qualitatively, you would change the the, the point of, of, of the liftoff, and, and everything would, would would still go through. Then related to banks wanted to preserve the deposit to loans ratio. This is not something banks want to do in our model. So they solve, uh, they are perfectly rational in our model. They uh, solve uh, an optimization problem. And uh, what we show is that what the result of, 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 this, uh, of this optimization problem. There might be some frictions that we are not currently considering. Uh, in particular, I think it might be important also to consider uh, market power. We are going 
with a perfectly competitive banking sector, this might have as well some, some effects. So in a sense, I would see these results as a lower, lower bound of the macro effects, but they could be more important if we were to think of other, other, other frictions and constraints that we are not taking into account. And then regarding the uh, last comment by, by Davide, uh, I think I would need to think a bit more. Uh, indeed, the interaction of CBDC affects government finances in the same way as cash uh, does. So, but then the comment about inflation here, it is pinned down by the policy of the central bank that just wants to keep inflation at zero in the steady state. And that's why it adjusts the policy rates corridor in the exercise that I've shown. But I think I might be missing something of, from your question. So perhaps we can discuss later because uh, I think there, there's, I need to think a bit more what, what you asked. But thanks, thanks for the questions. Okay, thank you very much. And um, let's move on straight. We are a bit behind time. So Yiming is a associate professor of finance at Columbia University. And uh, yeah, now we move to stable coins and stable coins. The one difference to CBDC is that they may have uh, liquidity problems. And that's uh, the content of the paper, as I understand. Go ahead, yeah. Thank you so much uh, to the organizers for having us on the program. Thank you, everyone, for still being here for the last paper. Uh, it's a great pleasure to share our work with us. This is joint work um, with Yao Deng at Wharton and Anthony Zhang at Chicago. All right, so here are the slides. If you're not super familiar with stable coins, uh, there's essentially four main facts that you want to remember. Okay, first that they're a blockchain asset, so their supply is recorded on the blockchain, but there's many blockchain assets. And the defining feature of stable coins is that they are relatively stable in their prices, right? So, you know, Bitcoin is going up and down a lot in terms of prices, but stable coins have this benefit of being relatively stable at a one US dollar price on the secondary market. All right, and that has led to their growth in the last couple of years. They really started around 2020 out of nothing. And in 2022, they actually amounted to over 130 billion in US dollars um, in total assets under management. Right? And it's this fast growth that is the first reason for why regulators have increasingly been paying attention to them. The second feature for why they're important for regulators is that they are backed by US dollar assets, right? So this includes treasuries, US dollar deposits, even corporate bonds and money market fund instruments, right? So for Bitcoin and other crypto assets, you may say, you know, if there is an issue, it's just a bunch of rich kids losing their money. But you can't say the same for US dollar stable coins, because if there's a run on these stable coins, they're at risk of selling en masse their asset holdings, which you do care about for the traditional financial system, right? In the sense of deposit markets matter, treasury markets matter, et cetera, et cetera. So in that sense, US dollar stable coins form a bridge between the decentralized uh, crypto ecosystem and the real financial system that deserves our attention. All right. And finally, there's one peculiar trait of the current uh, US dollar backed stable coins, which is that they don't issue dividends. So if you hold a money market fund or an ETF, you know, that fund is going to distribute the returns on the assets to you as the investor in the form of dividends. And currently, uh, stable coins do not do so for a variety of reasons. All right, and so this discussion on stable coins has been going on for a while, but it really intensified in an um, advent of the recent episodes. So Silicon Valley Bank is one um, episode of that. It turns out that the second largest US dollar stable coin uh, circle was the largest holder of Silicon Valley Bank deposits. And on this graph, I show the price of Circle over the uh, event of the Silicon Valley bank crisis. And you see that they're definitely not at one. You see that the price is really dropping to well below one to reach about 87.5 uh, cents on the dollar. Right? And people look at this event and some will say, well, this really looks like a bank run or this looks like a run on money market funds. And we know that these institutions have coordination failure and we need to uh, prevent coordination failure because they're inefficient. 
right? But other people look at this and they will say, well, this is like the share price year for ETF, or this is even like a price on the stock exchange. And the change in prices on an exchange is just demand and supply doing its job and the market reaching an efficient price, right? And there's nothing we ever want to think about regulating um, a market that is just doing its job. All right, so in this paper, we want to take a closer look at what stablecoins actually are and how they actually work. All right, so the first question we pose is like, what is the actual market structure of the stablecoin? What is the underlying economics? And what does it imply about the potential for runs in the stablecoins? Right? And in particular, what is the effect of the market structure on run risk? Right? And finally, once we have um, a model set up and we can understand the effect of market structure, we can then also ask, you know, hypothetically, what can we do to improve the stability of stablecoins? In particular, if they were to issue dividends to their investors like other funds are doing, would that actually improve things? All right, so first up, we discover that the stablecoin is unlike any one institution, right? On one hand, it is like an ETF, right? So if you hold a stablecoin share, you're trading these shares on a secondary market, just like you're trading ETF shares, right? So there's buyers and sellers, and there's a secondary market price, P. Now, different from the ETF, however, there is this set of investors called arbitragers. These investors can look at the secondary market price, and if that price falls below $1, they can choose to buy stablecoins off the secondary market and take that stablecoin to the issuer, right? This is the firm that's issuing the stablecoin and redeem in cash one US dollar for the stablecoin, right? And in doing so, they are profiting, right? They're buying low, selling high. But at the same time, this arbitrage process is great for the price stability of the stablecoin because it helps to stabilize the price in secondary markets to that $1 redemption value. Right? So we look at this and we thought, if the stablecoin issuer wants to have a coin that is very stable in price, they should be encouraging arbitrage. Right? Because efficient arbitrage is helpful for price stability and keeping the peg in the secondary market. But we were surprised when we looked at the blockchain that actually stablecoins only have very few arbitragers. In fact, the largest stablecoin, Tether, only makes use of six unique arbitragers in any given month. Right? And that, again, is surprising if you think that they should be incentivizing arbitrage, having a more competitive arbitrage sector so that they can better achieve price stability. Right? So there must be something else that stablecoins are worried about right, that made them choose such a concentrated set of arbitragers. And what we find, both in the data and in the theory, is that the reason is that they're worried about runs, right? because it's precisely arbitrage that is incentivizing investors' incentive to run. Right? Because why you know, do the investors want to take their money out? It's because they worry that tomorrow there's no more money left. All right? But now if you tell me every time I sell in the secondary market, my price impact is immediately absorbed by the arbitragers, right? that is incentivizing me to sell more because that penalty of a lower price from selling pressure is now eliminated. Right? And so in this sense, arbitrage is this double-edged sword in the stablecoin context, where on one hand, it encourages and improves price stability in the secondary market, but that exact same process is also increasing the risk of runs and hence hurting financial stability. Right? And so the market structure of the stablecoin implies an inherent trade-off between price and financial stability. Right, so if we build a model, we estimate the model, we find that for the largest two stablecoin issuers, run risk is pretty high. And if you've been following the conversation, this may not be surprising for the largest stablecoin, Tether. But for the second largest, people usually think of this stablecoin as really being the good guy in the market. Right? With safer assets, better uh, transparency, et cetera, et cetera. And the reason why even the second largest, so Circle, still has significant run risk in our setting is that Circle actually chooses its arbitrage sector to be much more competitive. Right? And that is increasing its run risk, conditioning on the assets that it's holding. Right? And finally, we find that if both of them actually were to issue dividends in invest to investors, that would both uh, reduce run risk as well as improve price stability. They're currently not doing it, perhaps for regulatory reasons, but also because that would cut into their profits. 
All right, so uh, we built on a lot of work and there's a very fast growing literature on, on stable coins. Um, so let me maybe skip this slide in the interest of time. Okay, so the data we have, actually the most important source of data is the blockchain data itself. As mentioned, it's a blockchain asset. So we just look at the blockchain from which we can obtain each single transaction between the stablecoin issuer and each of its arbitragers, the time, the amount, the unique identifier of the wallet that is burning and minting these stable coins, right? And actually as regulators, you can do this too. It's not that difficult, right? So you actually don't need to collect any additional data, this data is readily available on the blockchain. We merge this with secondary pricing, secondary market price data, which is the stable coins are traded on these exchanges, and we take the prices on these exchanges to learn about the trading activity on the secondary market. And finally, we will collect the asset holdings that they report. Note this part is not on the blockchain. So we think of this as the most optimistic estimate of what they actually hold. Likely they would only report something that's better than what they hold, not something that's worse than they hold. But we take uh, for you know, what, what they tell us. And so everything we present today is in a way an op the most optimistic estimate of their run risk and price stability. Right? And this is how the data looks like. First off, you see that the secondary market price of stable coins is not always at one. For Tether, note this is the number one, right? It goes up and below one. And the same for the second largest coin, Circle, right? And this actually has also been shown by uh, others, uh, including and Ash's very nice work. And here, what we wanted to highlight is that the degree of price deviations differ. Notice that this is 0.96. So Tether's price fluctuations are much larger than those of Circle. Note this is 0.999. OK, and we find that this the difference in price deviation is related to the arbitrage sector that they're choosing. All right, so here I list the number of unique arbitrages in a given month for different stable coins. And you see that the largest one, Tether, has only six arbitrages in a month, whereas the second largest, Circle, has 521 unique arbitrages in a month. Right, so when we first found this, we just thought, this must be a mistake in the code. How could it be that they only have six? You know, they should really have much more, especially if Circle has that many more. Uh, luckily for us, we met one of these six arbitragers and they confirmed to us that they're indeed six arbitragers and um, that there's a very difficult and uncertain process of due diligence that they had to go through for Tether to approve them to be an arbitrager and that their friends, which means other crypto hedge funds, tried to do the same, but that they were not successful in doing so. All right, so this convinced that this, this cross-sectional variation in arbitrage concentration is real and we find that it also is related to the price stability on the secondary market. All right, so on the left graph, I have the number of arbitrages on the x-axis and the average price deviation on the y-axis. And each coin is a dot. So as you see that as the number of arbitrages used goes up, you also are reducing average price deviations. Similarly, if you, think, if you wanna think about concentration. Right? And so we stopped here and we thought, why would any coin choose to have few arbitragers? Or why would any coin choose to have a large concentration of arbitragers? Right? If the goal is only price stability, then everyone would want to maximize the amount of arbitrage that happens through more competition and through a larger number of arbitragers. Right? And the model we build is going to very closely uh, follow that question and find an answer in the type of assets that these stable coins hold, okay? Because it turns out that Tether, the coin that is choosing a more concentrated arbitrage space, also has the more illiquid balance sheet, right? So these are different reporting periods, and you see that for Tether, it holds deposits, treasuries, money market instruments, but it also holds about 10, 15% in terms of illiquid assets like corporate bonds, loans, and this other's category, they have a footnote saying this is everything from gold to crypto. I think therefore it's crypto. So you can think of the last three columns as being more illiquid assets. All right, compare that to the business uh, model of Circle, which is much, much more heavily concentrated in deposits, treasuries, or what we traditionally think as more liquid assets. 
right? Notice though that even 100% in deposits doesn't mean that you're 100% in cash because as we now all understand, right? Even if your deposits are in FDIC insured deposit institutions, it doesn't mean that your deposits are FDIC insured, right? So I would view this as they are relatively narrow banks, but there's no such thing as a pure narrow bank. And Tether is more like a traditional bank that has more e-liquid assets than Circle is. And it is that choice that we will argue led to their respective choices and arbitrage concentration. All right, so with that, let me give you a very, very quick sketch of the model. Four periods, four types of investors. Investors, the stablecoin, um, are choosing, first off, whether they want to put their money in the stablecoin. And their choice is going to be dependent on whether the stablecoin can give them price stability. Okay, so they like price stability. They also don't like runs. Okay, and they will decide whether they want to run or not uh, between time two and three. All right, there's going to be some noise traders who are the reason why there is price instability. And then there's arbitragers. These are the six for a tether or the 521 for a circle, right? That help to mitigate the effect of any uh, noise trading on price stability, right? And finally, we have the stablecoin issuer. Um, we will model them as holding the illiquid reserve asset. And so we will fix the illiquidity of that assets in the outset and focus on their choice of choosing the concentration of the arbitrage sector, which is N. Right? And this asset that they hold is illiquid. Um, it also is risky to some extent. So it has some possibility of having a positive return in the long run. All right, at time equals to one, this is where the price instability and the noise trading happens. So there's a bunch of noise traders. They can go in and out, and that creates a variance in the price. Right? This variance, though, can be reduced by this smaller K parameter. And this K parameter captures how efficient arbitrage is. Right? If you have a larger number of arbitragers, N, or if arbitragers have a better balance sheet capacity, Xi, that means the K is going to be smaller and noise traders are going to have a lower effect on the price variance. And that is something that the investors would like. Right? Investors at the same time are also going to think about whether they want to run from the stablecoin or not. If they decide to run and sell at t equals to two, we take them to obtain an equilibrium price of q, and that is if lambda investors sell. All right, and they're gonna think about this q comparing to it, what it would get if they were to wait until time equals to three, right? Because if everyone else ran from the coin at time equals to two, nothing would be left at time equals to three, and then they would just be getting zero. Okay, but if there's enough people who stayed in the fund in time equals to two, hanging in there until time equals to three could get stablecoin investors a long-term benefit. Think of that as the benefit from being able to use and hold on to the stablecoin in the long run. All right, and if you remember one thing from the model, please let it be this picture. This picture shows the entire intuition, which is what is the relative gain of waiting until the long run Okay, for a given investor compared to how many other investors are selling. All right, you see that this line is above zero at the beginning, which means that if not a lot of people sell, then it's beneficial for me to wait. Quite intuitive. All right? Now, notice the slope is also going up, which is what we would expect from a normal exchange trading market, which just says if more other people sell, the lower the exchange price becomes and that discourages me from further selling. This is a strategic substitutability, which is the opposite of a run. All right, although notice that at some point there is a unique threshold after which the number, as the number of selling investors goes up, the payoff from waiting steeply goes down and becomes negative, right? That is the point when the mismatch in the illiquidity of the stablecoin's assets and that fixed $1 redemption value spills over through the arbitrage sector to induce a run incentive in the secondary market for investors. Right? That is the point in which the strategic substitutability turns into a strategic complementarity, which is the definition of a coordination failure. So despite exchange trading, despite all this new blockchain technology, we show that among secondary market investors of the stablecoin, there still exists that run incentive. 
All right, and this run incentive is actually higher if arbitrage is more efficient because again, arbitrage lowers the price impact, right? The penalty of selling early, and hence it makes selling early even better. All right, that is extent to that is the sense in which arbitrage actually could be bad in this particular case in terms of uh, incentivizing runs. Right, and that is also why there's this trade-off between price stability that is helped by arbitrage and financial stability that is hurt by arbitrage. All right, and the beginning of the game is that we let the issuers optimize, so they're going to care about how big their stablecoin is, times for each unit of that coin, how much in revenue they're making. And in that choice, it is uh, consistent for them that if they have a more illiquid asset base to choose a more concentrated um, uh, arbitrage sector because the more illiquid assets is making them more susceptible to a run and hence they cannot afford a lot of price stability. They have to constrain their arbitrage or else they will suffer a run and all the investors will run away from them. And that is exactly the case that Tether is currently under. Now Circle is running a different business model where they choose more, relatively more liquid assets that is better for their run problems. Right? So even if they were to sell these assets, the discounts wouldn't be so high. And that gives them the ability to have more co competitive arbitrage because they're not as worried about runs. And that more competitive arbitrage allows them to give investors more price stability, which is something also that is attracting a larger investment base. Right? And finally, we will look at the effect of issuing dividends through the lens of our model. And the big uh, takeaway is generally that having the benefit of the dividend sitting at the end of the game makes investors more incentivized to stay in the stablecoin and less incentivized to sell. So that is something that allows the issuer to use more arbitragers and achieve higher price stability. Although the effect on run risk depends because there is another channel that's uh, happening, which is as the issuers are taking more of the returns and giving that to the uh, investors, they also have less skin in the game themselves. So they have less skin in the game to reduce uh, the run risk and to reduce the default risk. Okay, so the last thing we do is to take our model to the data to actually see if, it, if any of this matters economically. And just a very, very brief overview of how we take it to the data. We take a couple of moments directly, including how illiquid the assets are, including what is the long-term benefit of holding the stablecoin. And this we approximate using what is the long-term lending rate of a stablecoin, thinking that this must be the nominal benefit that you're getting because an investor can always choose to lend out the stablecoin rather than using it. And finally, we use the distribution of fundamentals uh, by bucket CDS spreads according to the asset allocation. All right, and with that, we only have two uh, key parameters left, and we will use two moments to jointly match these parameters. All right, the one is just how much variance is there and how much people dislike that price instability or that variance in price. And second one is what is investors' demand, right? How Quickly, are they going to go away from a given stablecoin if their utility from that stablecoin changes? All right, and we will use two parameters. One is this arbitrage capacity. Okay, so how good, how efficient can arbitragers arbitrage away price deviations? Because if we find that arbitrage efficiency is chosen to be very high, that must have meant that investors really, really dislike price variance, or else the issuer wouldn't have chosen such a high arbitrage competition. All right, and the second one is just uh, very direct. If you look at how big this, how much the size of the uh, stablecoin fluctuates with respect to the long-term benefit, and that tells us something about the demand for stablecoins with respect to the benefits that investors are receiving. All right, so uh, we capture these two parameters from the data. This first one about arbitrage demand elasticity is just how much does the price fluctuate for a given unit of redemptions, right? So again, this is the secondary market price deviation with respect to a unit of redemptions that the arbitragers are doing with the issuer. And the intuition is that if I do a redemption, but there's a very large price deviation, that must have meant that my arbitrage is very ineffective, right? Because I'm essentially leaving a lot of money on the table. 
right? And that is the case for Tether, the one that has six arbitrages, as we would expect. Arbitrage is just not very efficient because for each 10 percentage point increase in arbitrage, uh, you're leaving 2.1 cents larger price deviations on the table, right? And that number is smaller, as you can see, for Circle, right? The one that has 521 arbitrages, and that is mapping here exactly into a more efficient arbitrager because for the same amount of arbitrage that happens, you're leaving a smaller amount on the table. Right, that is the first parameter. The second parameter, again, is how elastic is the investor base. And here we just simply look at how does the market size respond to changes in lending rate. All right, and with that, overall, we estimate run risks that I think are pretty high. Maybe you can uh, tell me later about what you think of these numbers. In particular, Circo has a pretty high number, and this was a bit against our priors. We would have thought that Circo, because of the safer and more liquid assets, would have very minimal run risk. But in this case, it is really the choice of those 521 arbitragers, the more competitive arbitrage sector, that contributes to the high run risk of even Circle. And so taken together, both of them have pretty high run risk. And the last thing we do is, again, to look at you know, what would happen if stablecoins were to issue dividends to investors. And the first graph is about how the price stability would change. And you see that variance goes down, so price stability improves. As discussed, that's because people are more happy to stay, and hence issuers are more comfortable to choose a more competitive arbitrage sector. And second, run risk also goes down. And so it turns out that this incentive for people to stay dominates all other channels of reduced skin in the game. All right, so with that, let me quickly conclude. Uh, we wanted to really try to understand stable coins maybe uh, from the lens of financial institutions. We think that they're not exactly a money market fund. They're not exactly an ETF. They're more like a combination between the two and that they still suffer from run risk despite them being traded on an exchange and despite them optimizing on their arbitrage sector. Right? And that points to this trade-off between price and st financial stability in the sector. And it also tells us that arbitrage efficiency and arbitrage capacity is something that is very important to monitor and understand if you want to monitor the run risk of these stable coins. And it's also something that is quite simple to do because that arbitrage sector, everything is recorded on the blockchain. All right, and lastly, uh, we speak to the potential of uh, stablecoins to be regulated as securities because we show that if they were to issue dividends, which would make them be classified as a security according to the SEC, that could actually improve both their price stability and run risk. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Ganesh is a professor from Warwick University and will discuss the paper, please. Great. Um, to thank you uh, to the organizers for inviting me. I'm happy to be here. Um, so incidentally, uh, Warwick actually organized a conference a couple of weeks ago on, on cryptos, and this paper was part of the program, and Cyril actually discussed the paper. So I, I'll try my best to add uh, to, to Cyril's discussion and ho hopefully have a couple of extra points. OK, so, so stable coins, as many of you know, are, are cryptocurrencies pegged to the US dollar. And they serve a number of uses. Primarily, they're used as vehicle currencies in the crypto market. So typically, to trade in Bitcoin and Ethereum, most liquid pairs are Bitcoin stablecoin pairs. But they also have some alternative use cases, um, like, say, remittances, and potentially as a hedge against macroeconomic policy in emerging markets, so, so countries with high inflation, for example. So this paper, in uh, my view, is the first paper to combine two to important topics in stablecoins. The first is on run risk, and this is um, very similar to sort of thinking about money market funds and how the, if they're illiquid assets, um, you could have investors uh, sort of re trying to redeem um, their funds during a period of stress. And so very similar sort of um, example can be in stable coins when investors want to redeem their stable coin tokens um, and withdraw their dollar deposits during periods of stress. And there are some 
uh, famous examples such as the Silicon Valley bank run and um, USDC depegged earlier this year. And there have also been other examples of Tether depegging as well. Um, the other topic is arbitrage design. And so here, the arbitrage is similar to an ETF um, sort of pegging to its uh, net asset value. And so here, you can think of um, if there's a deviation between primary and secondary markets, investors can essentially arbitrage. So through deposits and redemptions, they can arbitrage between the primary and secondary markets. So these um, two sort of important topics are kind of linked together in a unifying framework. So there are three um, contributions. So it is a, a, a theoretical uh, model as well as empirical evidence. And one is that there is this empirical evidence that in the cross section, currencies that have more, um, or stable coins that have more arbitrageurs uh, have more peg stability. So there is this idea that the more um, sort of easy access to arbitrage a stable coin has, the more stable the peg. Then in, in the model, there's this interesting trade-off between price stability and financial stability. And so this is the idea that although having more arbitrage improves the peg, um, so makes the peg more stable, it does come at a cost of uh, increasing run risk. And so the idea, um, or the concept here, is that when you have a lot of arbitrage, then it essentially increases um, or makes it more likely that there is a run on the stable coin. So investors are more likely to coordinate in a sell-off when the arbitrage is very efficient. So it actually increases their payoff to, to do a coordinated sell-off. And so that's why we get this trade-off between uh, price stability and financial stability. And the third, which I think is very interesting, uh, especially being uh, at an ECB conference is, is thinking about regulations and to policy tools. And so they um, showed that a dividend could potentially increase uh, peg stability as well as um, reduce run risk. And the idea is that by repatriating um, profits to investors, then they, they, it, it increases their participation um, and it also allows a more efficient arbitrage, and then investors um, also uh, get a more long-term benefit from holding the coin, and that also reduces run risk. So just a brief overview of the stablecoin market. So, so the big players in this market are Tether and USDC. Um, so the stablecoin market is relatively new, so it was practically non-existent a few years ago, and then it, it kind of skyrocketed since the uh, pandemic. And it reached about a peak of $180 billion or so, but it has sort of come down a bit since then. And so a lot of uh, my discussion will also focus on this competition between USDC and Tether. So they're the two big players. They both are backed primarily by dollar assets and, of course, of varying uh, degrees of liquidity. Um, so, tr for example, treasury bonds and other interest uh, yielding assets. So if we look at Tether's balance sheet, um, there is a source of illiquid assets, and this is essentially the run risk uh, that you might have illiquid assets, and if there are a lot of redemptions that exceed the value of liquid reserves, then you uh, essentially can trigger a run. And so, for example, um, in quarter one of this year, there are about 85% in so-called cash or cash equivalent assets, but there are 15% in sort of corporate bonds, also Bitcoin and other um, sort of riskier assets as well. So this is essentially the source of run risk um, that we think about is, is the illiquidity of the balance sheet. So the um, main empirical result that I want to summarize is this peg efficiency in the cross section. So essentially on the left panel, we have the number of arbitrageurs. And the more a stable coin has, if a stable coin has a large number of arbitrageurs, they have uh, very low deviations from the peg, so they're more stable. Whereas a coin that has very few arbitrageurs uh, is relatively unstable. 
And a different way of looking at it is looking at the market share of the AP. So if you are more concentrated arbitrage, or if more of the arbitrage is done, say, by the top five arbitrageurs, then that also um, increases the instability of the peg, right? So essentially, concentrated arbitrage leads to more peg instability. Now, in terms of explaining differences, Tether is um, harder to essentially get arbitrage access to. And, and part of it is they have these additional fees associated with redemptions. They also require redemptions to be minimum of 100,000. And I think that there are potentially some banking jurisdiction issues as well, where Tether operates outside the US. And so it might be harder to sort of um, do the relevant documentation to get arbitrage access. So there could be, so there is sort of this difference in due diligence between Tether and USDC, which explains this um, arbitrage, number of arbitrages uh, different between the two coins. Okay, so now um, to the model summary. Um, there are four agents. Um, there are noise traders, and you can think of uh, these traders as doing remittances, or essentially um, they're just using it for hedging purposes. And they uh, trade in periods one and two. Then arbitrageurs essentially um, sort of try to uh, do deposits and redemptions with the, the issuer to essentially take advantage of peg deviations. Okay, so they're making profits between the primary and secondary market price. Um, then there are these informed investors, and these are the investors that trigger a stablecoin run. And so they observe period one prices, and based on that, they participate in the market. Then in period two, that's when they have this um, run decision, whether they decide to wait till period three based on the benefits of holding the coin, or alternatively, they sell in period two, and that triggers the run. The issuer is essentially um, at t equals zero is maximizing their profits and they are choosing the level of arbitrage n. So you could think of, for example, Tether uh, has these redemption fees and uh, withdrawal so that they are essentially setting this um, based on the amount of profits they want. So, um, the period one prices, there's only noise trading, so we get a symmetric uh, equilibrium. And you can think of this as peg discounts and peg premiums. And the size of the discounts and premiums are essentially a function of K, which is uh, sort of an arbitrage efficiency parameter. So K is a function of N, which is the number of arbitrageurs, and it's decreasing in N. So when n is large, k is small, and you get a more stable peg. Um, period two, you also get um, these peg discounts. And here you have essentially this run equilibrium, where if, if the share of selling investors is sufficiently high, then um, you will get this additional selling pressure, uh, which we see here, and also from um, have, having the illiquid assets. So, so essentially, um, the prices are connected to the arbitrage. So the more efficient the arbitrage, the smaller the discounts and, and the more stable the peg. So um, the investors have this payoff function and they are essentially, um, if they are not in the run regime, then they get some long-term benefits from holding the coin. But if sufficient investors sell, so if lambda is sufficiently high, then there is essentially a run and they get zero long-term benefits. Then the issuer maximizes profits, where G is essentially the investor uh, base. And the second term is just the excess returns on, the, on, on assets of the issuer. So there is this trade-off between um, price stability and financial stability. And essentially, it's captured by this payoff function h, which is plotted here. And note that this payoff function is based on the long-term benefits, less sell the selling the coin in period two, which is, 
And so the idea is that if arbitrage is more efficient, then the period two price is higher, so it's closer to one. So that means it increases the payoff of selling. So that's why when you have more efficient arbitrage, this payoff curve shifts down, which is essentially saying that you're more likely to sell um, when arbitrage is very efficient. So there's also this interesting discussion on dividends. And essentially, dividends can be modeled as um, increasing the long-term benefits of the investor. But at the same time, um, there is this effect on issuer profits. And so we'll f um, in the calibration in the paper, they find that uh, increasing dividends by increasing the long-term value of the investor does uh, reduce run risk and increase uh, peg stability. OK, so now to um, the comments. So the first comment I have is that the n or the number of arbitrageurs is the choice variable of the issuer. So the issuer could, in principle, also jointly determine um, the asset illiquidity phi and n. And so I think by doing this, we can analyze a few different um, scenarios that I'll, I'll mention in, in subsequent comments. But I think um, a lot of the trade-off between peg stability and financial stability is coming from changing n and holding phi constant. But I think it would be interesting to also um, jointly model the asset illiquidity choice n, n. So the idea that I have in mind is that when you think about all of these different stablecoin issuers, USDC and Tether are the main ones. And USDC typically have larger n, so they're more arbitrage, but they also have less asset illiquidity. So I think in a framework where you can think about phi and n as choice variables, then you can rationalize why USDC prefer this point and then Tether prefers this point. And what are the sources of differences? So I think there could be um, different fundamentals. Um, the private signal of investors are different. The interest rate schedule. So there are lots of different parameters um, that USDC and Tether have different parameters, and that can determine their different allocation. So a related point is welfare, and um, this relates to uh, Cyril's discussion a couple of weeks ago as well. And the idea is that um, we can think of a narrow bank as essentially um, when n is really high and phi is very low. Right, so, so a narrow bank is a specific case where arbitrage is very efficient and you don't have any liquid assets. And so I think it'd be very interesting to think a bit about welfare as a sort of social planner and think about as a regulator, you want to be closer to a narrow bank, but as an issuer, you do care about your profit. So you might want some asset illiquidity, so you want some FI, but at the expense of having inefficient arbitrage. So some interesting um, uh, policy questions. And for competition, I also think um, one can think about competition in this framework as there's now an outside competitor that's taking a lot of the investors uh, away. And so you might de-risk um, in order to maintain your user base. And I think, uh, for example, uh, USDC um, reduced their commercial paper to zero in July 2022, and Tether followed. And I think there's a competition effect going where if your competitor de-risks, it forces you to de-risk as well to maintain your user base. And my last comment is thinking about other solutions. So here it's just kind of thinking about sort of the policy toolkit. And dividends is very interesting and I, I think quite topical because of the SEC wanting to regulate stable coins, but I think other um, potential solutions could be real-time auditing, and there are some blockchain companies that do that, and I think that would reduce the, the noise of the signal that these investors have. And capital requirements, of course, um, would effectively reduce FI, right? It would reduce your liquid assets, and that should also improve the arbitrage and uh, peg stability. Um, so I have some minor comments uh, just for the authors, so let me conclude. Um, so this is the first paper to really think about combining features of a money market fund with an ETF and in a unifying framework. 
Um, so they have some interesting cross-sectional evidence that links arbitrage to peg stability. And the model has an interesting trade-off between uh, peg stability and financial stability. And there are also some interesting uh, policy questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, we are running late, and Barbara wants to have some final closing remarks. So we have, um, yeah, let's quickly just collect questions and comments in one round. And, and I have just a little, you know, on um, technical comment. So you take the average liquidity of assets, right? Um, but of course, um, you know, the, the game is not the average, but the, the marginal is important, no? Because a run, you know, first um, is, uh, let's say, satisfied with uh, liquidating the most liquid assets. So the, the game of uh, any, you know, balance sheet is to have income generation through the assets while having liquidity when you need to redeem. So if you just put the average, of course, you, you know, it's a, it's a big difference, you know, whether you have, uh, I mean, you, you should have first very liquid assets at the margin for satisfying. So I don't know if one can refine the model by looking at the continuum of asset liquidity. Um, and the second comment was that I had, uh, I mean, the, the, the true corner solution um, is, is, you know, to just impose uh, um, convertibility on the issue of a stablecoin. So that's what Mika does in Europe, no? So the, sta the stablecoin issuer cannot just organize a market and lead it to arbitrage, but he, I mean, the issuer has to basically ensure convertibility in the same sense as e-money is, you know, convertible. The issuer has a duty to convert one to one. That's the avenue taken by Mika. And at the same time, Mika prohibits um, remuneration of stable coins. So, you know, it takes quite an approach where your paper may say this is, uh, you know, uh, quite critical. But some more questions, comments, please, yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> Quantum and Weyer, University of Chicago. So I still don't fully understand why you can have a run if you have a stable coin that's 100 percent in deposits. So I get that if you have something like SVB, there might actually be a run on the bank at the same time. But then it feels to me that what you would expect to have is something like the stable coin price is going to reflect a bet on, on whether the government is going to bail out the bank. And I'm wondering if that's enough to trigger a run on the stablecoin as well, and I, I don't really see that. Thanks. Yeah, there's someone. Hi, David Porcelaki for the ECB. So I uh, was very interested in your estimates for the probability of runs. I was wondering if you have something about the correlation. Like, is it more likely that the runs happen at the same time on these two, uh, on these digital currencies? Thank you. Okay, and I think we should stop there. And Ming, if you want to answer to the discussion and to the points. All right. Uh, thanks so much to Ganesh. That you know, it's a very, very thoughtful discussion. Um, let me start with the discussion and just maybe summarize some of the big picture thoughts we had. I think obviously we need to go back and actually prove a lot of these things in the theory. Um, so yes, so we currently choose to fix the illiquidity and let the issuer choose the arbitrage concentration is a bit the focus of the paper because many things can be sort of undone you know with one choice versus the other so if you want to have a low run risk you can choose a set of uh, low illiquidity um, and higher concentration a uh, higher competition or you can choose um, high um, high high illiquidity and then high concentration. So in a way, they, they negate each other, and which is why you know, we currently fix one and choose the other. But also, it's the case that Tether is offshore and USDC Circle is based in the US. So they don't exactly have the same access to a lot of the assets. So um, Tether doesn't have the same access to invest in US dollar or US based deposit institutions, but that's just a minor thing. I agree with you in general that, you know, if we do think about, you know, what, why variables cannot be canceled out between, you know, fixing one and choosing the other, that really opens up the kind of questions we can ask and that really leads to a much richer set of results. Um, for example, the discussion on competition, I think is a very interesting one. Um, again, we have to go back to, to prove it, um, but my sense 
is that allowing for more competition, um, on one hand, it does incentivize the issuer to choose both a lower run risk, so more liquid assets, and more price stability, uh, which is a larger number of arbitrages because, again, if there's more competition, your demand elasticity of the investors goes up, so you have to offer a better contract to attract people. But notice that more competition also has the effect that it reduces the issuer's skin in the game, right? Standard is how competition affects the banking sector. Just, you know, your equity stake is going to go down. And that has, at the same time, a risk-taking incentive. So in the end, the, the you know, equilibrium effect of competition can go both ways, depending on which of these channels dominate. Um, then on welfare, I think that's a very important question. I think you're right that if currently all the profits are just going to the issuer and if we care about financial stability and price stability in the general economic system and don't care about the issuer as much, then the narrow bank would be the way to go because that bank, like the pure narrow bank without any illiquidity. By the way, you're right, Quantum, that you know, if the bank, if the stablecoin doesn't have any illiquid assets, so purely cash, there is also no run risk in this model, right? So there's run risk to the extent that there's really no 100% uh, narrow bank possible. But that narrow bank would be optimal if you just want to reduce run risk. And then you can still offer high price stability by allowing a lot of arbitrages because there's no run in the first place. Right? But then the question becomes, you know, there are these profits that are currently going to the issuer and what's underlying those profits, if you think about it, in a way is the value of liquidity transformation. Right? It goes back to, you know, should we just have very narrow banks or should we have banks funding loans? Right? That's a bit of an exaggeration, but it goes along the same lines of thinking, should we, you know, should we attach a value to some financial institutions holding e-liquid assets and transforming those e-liquid assets in the system? But if you don't care about that, you're right that you know, the narrow bank is likely the way to go. Um, and then, yes, other, so other ways to, to help the sector. So you know, issuing dividends is certainly not the only one. And we should definitely think about the ones that you highlighted. Um, one other one that you know, we have been thinking about is just simply impose uh, redemption fees, which Tether in Way has been doing. But notice that for any of those restrictions on redemptions, um, what you're doing is you are helping financial stability. You're reducing run risk but you're also just harming price stability or right? just making it more difficult to take money out of the bank, right? And that, I think, goes similar to this, you know, should we have a mandate of one-to-one -one conversion? Should we always promise to convert or, you know, redeem any um, coins? I think that would be great for price stability reasons and you could potentially say for equity reasons. But then what we really show here is that if you're at the same time are holding illiquid assets, that could also have some um, side effects on actually amplifying, amplifying the risk involved. Okay, and then, you know, the question on average liquidity versus margin liquidity. So it is right that in practice, you know, they may not be proportionately selling their assets. And so the marginal is different from the average in practice. Um, it is also true, though, in diamond-dipic type of models that the only thing that matters is whether investors think that there is enough assets left in the bank, right? Once there's the belief that if the bank sells all the assets or if the stablecoin sells all the assets and there's not enough left, there will be a run. And hence, the order on which the assets are sold, right, doesn't exactly matter in that sense, right? Because in the end, it's if we sold all the assets, that the issuer holds, whether there is enough. And that's, I think, the fundamental like, threshold for whether there's a run or not. I think that should be helpful. OK, maybe, yeah. Maybe the other questions can uh, be solved uh, bilaterally, because now Barbara will close the conference. We can stay seated for a moment. Um, many thanks. I have the honor to wrap up and close this conference. Um, Cyril, but also my co-organizers uh, urged me to be brief, so I will. <laughs> so give me uh, five minutes. Um, as promised, uh, this year's conference, we learned a lot about central banks' operational frameworks, the demand for reserve, um, its drivers, and much more. Uh, Philip Lane elaborated that in the new normal steady state, the ECB should avoid risks associated with excessive scars or excessive abundant reserves. 
This is very balanced, but I read that some journalists understood him differently. Uh, Laurie Logan was carefully weighing the costs and benefits of a large central bank balance sheet. She saw a floor system with ample reserves as the most beneficial. Still, the optimal size of the central bank uh, balance sheet is difficult to pin down. Annette proposed that besides banks' demand for liquidity, uh, the optimal amount of reserves in the system depends on the size of deposits. Stefano, um, however, pointed out that in the euro area, the case might be a bit different, at least quantitatively. In addition, Ashura told us uh, that to find the optimal level of reserves, central banks uh, must take non-banks demand into account, demand for, for liquidity into account, not just banks. Speaking about non-banks, Quentin's work showed the benefits as well as the risk of, ex uh, of access to central banks' balance sheets to non-banks. Later, Davide emphasized the benefits of more liquidity to the economy. This has been contrasted by Vira, who argued that more liquidity makes liquidity crisis more likely, especially during QT. From the market panel, we heard that uh, the unsecured interbank market is dead, and that the repo market will continue to be the place to be for interbank, uh, interbank lending. Unfortunately, Davide showed us yesterday that monetary policy was imperfectly transmitted in repo market, especially for scarce bonds. Uh, however, thankfully, transmission has improved since that first rate hike last year. There is another important funding market apart from Repo, Venchin, uh, convinced us that the FX market um, are at least as important during times of crisis. Controlling the FX market uh, rate goes a long way in stabilizing the system. And speaking about controls and central bank crisis tools, Jeremy, Jeremy spoke on FS, FX risks and how bank swap lines are not a substitute for central banks' foreign reserve holdings, but rather a supranational credit line could do the trick. Coming back to the market panel, we also learned how a clean and neat operational framework could look like from the point of view of market practitioners. Louis suggested that central bankers should get rid of purchase programs as they do not bring joy, and also of the three-month refinancing operation for that matter, as Giuseppe pointed out. Rather, one should keep full allotment and avoid stigma uh, of using lending operations according to Arancha and Seth. Quite the opposite of this Marie Kondo operational framework was the machinery behind keeping a tight pack between Chinese offshore and onshore uh, currencies. As we have just heard from uh, Jorge and Jinmin, new forms of money will also keep central banks busy, and I'm sure we will hear a lot more about CBDC and stable coins in our future conferences. So you have seen from my far too brief and certainly not comp uh, comprehensive wrap up that it is impossible to summarize these rich discussions and presentations that we have seen during the last two days. But luckily, you will be have, having the opportunity to recap all our sessions on Monday online as we will publish them uh, on our website. So stay tuned. And also, um, I would like uh, my co-organizers to <laughs> maybe stand up. Because while I had the pleasure to, um, to uh, show you through the program, uh, you might not have seen all the faces of the co-organizers, which are um, Maria, Francesco, Sebastian, and Christian over there. <laughs> so give me a big uh, applause for them. And we also have uh, Nina and Britta, who are probably somewhere. I see Nina there, and uh, Britta somewhere else, probably. Uh, and also, we have Stefan and Anja. Uh, Anja. So, Stefan and uh, you, you don't see them, but in the back uh, behind the screens, we have a lot of support, uh, and without them, this would not have been possible. So many thanks to everyone, and um, especially also to the chairs, to the speakers, uh, and to the audience who have made this a very rich conference, and we hope to see you again next year. Many thanks.